Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today I'm going to provide an overview of Reese's faction in the upcoming Total War Troy, Reese's and Memnon DLC. Now, as the ruler of Thrace, Reese's will start out the game in the northern part of the map, surrounded by other Thracian tribes denoted by their rounded shield with the crescent top, and the initial goal of your campaign is to unite these tribes whether through war or through diplomacy before marching south into the Greek hinterlands with the combined might of the Thracian army. And as we can see from his victory condition, especially the Homeric victory, he will have his own unique 13-step epic mission chain. And along with that, you must also destroy or confederate the factions of Argos, Ithaca, and Mycena. Now Mycena is an obvious one because Agamemnon is the leader of the Greek factions, Argos is led by Diomedes, and Ithaca is led by Odysseus, and these two are responsible for Rhesus' death in the Iliad, so it's a bit of a revenge tour for us with the Homeric victory. In addition to this, we need a total of four countless host armies or more. Now this is a special faction mechanic for Rhesus' faction that we will cover in more detail a bit later on. As for the total war victory conditions, this is the typical regular faction requirements, a hundred different settlements sacked, raised, or occupied, the elimination of the three grand cities of Troy, Mycena, and Noxos, as well as defeating our first antagonist faction, which will appear on turn 75. So with our victory conditions covered, we'll take a look at our faction mechanic, our army setup, as well as our hero bonuses, starting with the faction mechanic of Countless Host. So this is the first unique faction mechanic for Rhesus, and as you can see, we can summon unique host armies from our forest regions. This is our wood producing counties, and the more forest regions we have, the more host armies and the more bonuses for the host armies we can acquire. And we'll be able to take a look at what exactly makes up a host army once we hop into game. But essentially they are low cost and low upkeep units that can be used for a special task because they cannot reinforce other armies or occupy settlements. So they're more of your raid attacking army that can help you whittle down the settlement before your main force takes it. An added bonus, aside from their cheap cost, is they will not count towards your administration burden, so they will not raise the upkeep of all your other armies. This is quite a nice bonus. And the most you can have is six countless host army, so that puts into perspective of the four required for the victory condition. Then aside from that, we have a second mechanic called Threshian Rituals. This is because Threshians believe in other gods aside from the Greek pantheon, and because of this, we don't have the traditional access of spy, envoy, and priestess agents. And that's going to be a common theme in this new DLC, as both factions are not Greek or Trojan, and they don't have access to spies, envoy, and priestesses as they replace them with other effects. In this case, for Rhesus, it's going to be a set of rituals that you can perform uh, with four different classes of rituals, one from each class at a time to use a new resource called Devotion uh, that can bring your faction bonuses, add new units, all sorts of different bonus that we can take a look at once we hop into game. Now aside from these faction mechanics, our armies, uh, the recommended playstyle for us is a roster relying on strong early engagement tools and decisive charges. His units fight predominantly without shields, however they have good charger, good armor piercing, and excellent morale. Rhesus has a strong shot infantry lineup and strong chariot presence. And because of this, we will not have access to warlords. So this is mentors, commanders, and warmongers. Uh, instead, we can have the fighter, the defender, and the skirmishers. And finally, with our unique unit, we're not going to go over them here. Uh, we will actually take a closer look at all the units. Uh, there are, I think, 27 unique new units for Rhesus, as there are a lot of units added in this DLC, since both of these factions are sort of representing new cultures, so they're getting completely new rosters, and we'll be using a custom battle to take a deeper look at each of his 27 units instead of focusing on just these four here. And lastly, we have our lineage bonus of providing four happiness faction-wide, and for his own army, 
plus 5 to charge for all units, and plus 3% casualty replenishment. And that's really going to do it. We're going to hop into game, take a look at our starting situation, and then talk about some of his mechanic in greater detail once we have uh, the panels in game to look at. So let's go Rue Thrice. Great recess of the Golden Armor. The Achaeans' brazen hordes have gone to war with Troy. Paris, Priam's favored son, has stolen Helen from the Spartan king Menelaus. Brother, your foolish passion has doomed us. You rule the forests on the northern Aegean shore, away from the clash of Achaeans and Trojans. Helenos, son of Priam, presides over Galepsos. We have his favor, and through him, that of Troy. The northern tribes have sworn to unite Thrace in your stead and turn Helenos against you. Still, many Thracians to the west bear you respect. Earn their fealty with words, not force. Chosen by gods both old and new, I will triumph. The eastern tribes belittle you and sneer at your ambitions. Make them bend the knee, even if you must sever their legs. Reach sacred Olympus, and let the gods watch as you cut a swathe through Achaea in blood and fury. Prove yourself their equal. A godlike king, deliverer of Troy itself. Alrighty, so that's our little flyby intro and our early missions to defeat the army in front of us. No worry about that. We start out with Burga. It's a wood county. So this would be where we can get countless hosts. And speaking of the countless hosts, let's take a look at them. But this is our first faction unique mechanic, and this requires us to have forest counties where we can summon these host armies. Currently, we have a settlement without an army, Burga, and we can create our own army. Now, General does not lead these armies. Instead, we have the Sons of Stramon, and Stramon is this mighty river that flows right next to our starting location. Apparently, there's a myth saying that uh, the river god of Stramon actually is our father, uh, but we're going with the more historical version here. And uh, we have Sons of Strama to lead our countless host. And these are simply bodyguard units. Uh, they're basically superior spear infantry uh, that will act uh, not as a single entity, but rather a retinue of units that you can use in battle as a general. It will have encouraged, very similar to when your general gets assassinated and you have to replace them with your next unit up. Uh, they would just have a bit more bonus. And then we have a bunch of Highland units, and there are five different varieties, and we can recruit them in any combination we want with the limitation here, 10 units, 10 units, 8, 8, 6. So you can't have, say, 20 of one unit. You have most 10 of one, some of them only 6. And you can create your own combination, and these are all free units. So you can do whatever you want in terms of recruitment costs, as the summoning cost is always preset at... 4,000 food, and 10 devotion, which is a unique resource uh, that we will cover when we talk about our rituals. Currently, we obviously don't have any devotion, but as you can see, the armies are cheap because it only costs food. The upkeep will also only cost food, and they don't count towards your administrative burden, so it wouldn't have a negative impact on your army. Obviously, the limitation being they cannot reinforce, and they also cannot occupy settlements. So they can't be a defensive force for you. They have to be on the field. They're there to fight, to raid, uh, to win battles for you. And as you gain more forest regions, once you gain two, for example, you now can have two armies. Not only that, your host units will receive additional benefits to their health, income when raiding and sacking what they do best, and increasing their ambush success chance. Then at tier three, requiring five forest regions, you can get three of these armies, you will get flanking attack improve attribute for all your highland warriors furious charge for highland raider unit this is a new special trait given to rhesus's faction uh, it's shared among a lot of his roster and what this does is when you charge from the front you will still apply the flanking debuff on the enemy and i believe 
this is not super clear because it doesn't say if it's the flanking from the back debuff or flanking from the side because there is a difference in the game. If you are flanking from the back, it's a 60% punishment to melee defense and a 10 point drop in morale. A flank from the side is only half of that. It's still significant. 30% melee defense reduction is huge, especially since the, the numbers you see are percentages already. So for example, if this Highland tribesman get flanked from the side, he will drop to six points of melee defense. Uh, it's not a percentage. These numbers you see are already percentages, hit chance, evasion chance, essentially. And um, you get to enjoy that bonus from a frontal charge from many of your units. And that's pretty significant if you can apply the flanking from back debuff with a frontal charge. Uh, you will gain more health. Uh, these are not cumulative. These are just added on bonuses. So instead of 10, you get 15 now. Uh, more income, armor piercing damage for missile units, and plus 10 missile range for your archer and javelin men. More percentage chance for ambushes. Then with 10 forest regions, you get four armies, no more deep sea attrition, you also get night battle, so even the odd where the enemy can't receive reinforcement as well. And the other bonuses still apply in greater number with some increases to your own melee defense and your melee attack as well on top of everything we saw before. Then if we move up to 15 forest regions, we now have five armies, uh, the same bonuses atop for the campaign attribute bonuses, but the stats are getting ever higher, 25% uh, health now. 20% to melee attack, melee defense, 15% to armor piercing damage, 20% to melee weapon damage. It's pretty massive at this point. Uh, these units, although quite simple uh, at the beginning with these boosts, they are becoming quite scary as this very simple unit is now going to have 44 melee attack and 52 melee defense plus all the damage boosts that you will see. And finally, at the final tier requiring 20 forest regions, we'll have our maximum of 6 armies and our host army can finally reinforce other army and be reinforced so they become regular armies and can do some serious damage. They will still have all the other benefits and you can see the final form is about 30% health, 20% to both melee attack and melee defense, 15% to armor piercing for melee, 20% for the melee weapon damage, and then 10% for all your range. So they become quite scary units and they are very cheap. You know, even if you get, like, say, the best one, you're under a thousand food for upkeep. So these are going to be quite core uh, to your playstyle. Now, there's a couple questions you guys might have. One, uh, how do I get devotion? We'll cover that once we talk about rituals. Two, how do I get enough forest regions? Well, I actually did a map here. Uh, I'm going to put it on the screen. There are 47 forest regions in the game, spread out across the world map, of course. And they're marked by these tree icons. And as you can see, um, there are plenty of trees, even within uh, the region that you normally would expand. So I marked 20 tree here. That doesn't even require you to go deep into Greece. Uh, it does require you to go east a little bit because there's plenty of trees where Penthalia starts. Now, she is a horde faction, so she's actually not going to take those land. So if you want to go over there and take those forests to give yourself some bonuses, before heading deeper into Greece, that is definitely a good choice. And by the time you come up to the borders uh, of Corinthia, you would have your 20 regions and you have a pretty easy time with your Highland units using the Countless Host mechanic. Now about the devotion, we have to talk about our second mechanic, and that is the Threshian rituals. And there are four types of rituals we can perform. You can perform one ritual from each category um, at all times so you can do it simultaneously but only one of the prayers can be done within each category at a time and you can see some of these are locked these are the greek god divine offerings they're the same cult support as a regular divine favor that we had from before uh, divine will and it costs you a bit of food a bit of wood and one devotion to make an offering and depending on the level of your temple that you're making this offering to, uh, you will get different amount of devotion and favor after each victorious battle. So the reward here is sort of a battle-based reward. So as long as you have 
the offering active from your divine offering, you basically pick one of the god or goddess to support, and for each fight, you can gain up to 40 points of favor with that god or goddess cult. And you also gain additional devotion to kind of replenish your initial cost. So it's actually quite cheap. After one battle, it pays for itself back, assuming um, you win some battles. Uh, the problem here is because you're gaining these post-battle, you will no longer receive any post-battle loot. And this is actually quite costly, in my opinion. So you do have to weigh uh, the amount of spoils you're missing out, especially with food, because fighting for food is often the way uh, to sustain yourself when you want to overexpand past your administrative burden. So pick your gods wisely. Now, if you have a bunch of armies fighting all over the map, it's not hard to imagine you can quickly ramp up one of these gods uh, divine will and then you can swap to a different god or goddess to build up their divine will at the same time you still have access to the traditional hecatomb and prayer all the same bonuses you can still build temple to boost uh, the divine will at the same time so it's quite flexible think of it as an additional way to gain divine will uh, to replace your priestess for example and the amount of you know um, divine will you can gain from this type of devotion uh, it's a lot easier in my opinion than priestess with the cooldown system so you can definitely control battles in the late game i believe most of your uh, god and goddess will be quite high using this mechanic now moving on to our uh, second uh, type of ritual now we're praying to our threshing gods and these are very different and you can see there is a cooldown timer once uh, this prayer wears off and there is uh, a duration timer to see how long these prayers will last you can only do one of these at a time and they cost different amounts doing different things now in the future i think we'll have a more detailed breakdown video since we're in the embargo period i can't really dive into everything in such fine detail but essentially these are army bonuses in this category of holy sacrifices as you can see their army effects and some of these are blocked out because you don't have the necessary buildings we will be taking a look at all the unique buildings added in as well as a few of the reform adjustments um, before we end uh, by reform i mean royal decree uh, since we are in troy and so far you have noticed we are spending devotion left and right how do we you know build up devotion well that comes to religious mysteries and these are ways we can get devotion and also receive more of a settlement bonus. And these gods are once again, uh, well, Dionysus is actually Greek. I think some of them are a mix uh, between the Thracian and the Greek gods. And you can see here, these are more of your faction-wide bonus for resource production. And you get one devotion per turn just by using food and stone. Only works for three turns before this goes on cooldown for three turns and i mean cooldown not as in this ritual goes on cooldown for three turns this entire category of rituals go down for three turns so if we pick this one for example we'll enjoy three turns of this unless we want to end it early and then there will be a three turn cooldown before we can come back and pick another one from this category and this one here uh the koti tia is probably my favorite one in the beginning. Not only are you going to be building up your forces early on, this is the one that provides plus two devotion per turn, so quite useful. And aside from that, we have a few that's not available, requiring a few more buildings as well. So you can see the Dolmen Shrine, and the Dolmen Shrine is another requirement over here. This is building that we will see. I'm actually going to jump into a slightly later save file on turn seven, where we actually control a settlement to showcase all the new buildings very soon. Uh, but continuing on here, our final one is to use our devotion for special units. Now, each of these are an oath to a certain Thracian god, and they can only be used in terms of praying to them, not only when you have the resources, but you have to have their temple. And their temple are not the same as the altars you built for the Greek pantheon. Instead, these temples are only available as special buildings in forest settlements, in major settlements and in farm settlements. And guess what? The first province you start out in has a wood settlement, a major settlement, and a farm settlement. So if you 
have your initial uh, settlement here, you can build all three temples and activate all your prayers. So with that said, uh, that's our two major mechanic. I'm going to jump into uh, this same exact game just about seven turns later where we have control of the settlements to take a look at all the unique buildings you can expect with this DLC. Alrighty, we're back. Um, just a couple turns later, we build up a full army using that devotion uh, boosting ritual. Now we have all these rank two units from that. And we're going to be delegating a fight here really, really quickly to show off a new added free update as part of this DLC launch. You do not need the DLC for this. This is given to all players. And that is the delegate warning. So you can see now which units will die, which units will lose over half of their health, and that's the yellow, and which units will be fine. And this is quite handy because in Troy, when units destroyed, they're gone for good. So let's take this. I am not playing this campaign, so I'm okay with losing that many units. And you can see, very accurate, very useful. Uh, it's coming to most of the Total War games in the future. I think it's ready in Warhammer 2 and will definitely be in Warhammer 3. We'll just be occupying this, this farm man. county. We have wiped out our first faction. And time to take a look at the new buildings uh, that we have been talking about. So if we look at uh, this settlement here, another free mechanic is the ability to rush buildings. It's always gold. It's based on how many turns left. And this is a very nice added bonus that we had enjoyed in Three Kingdoms for a while, now coming to Troy. Um, looking at the buildings, you can see in the main settlement, most of this look very familiar. The altars are the same. Um, the buildings here are a little bit different. Growth building, obviously the same exact. Uh, there is no more you know, spies being unlocked from the vineyard building, but it will still provide you happiness. The value of this building obviously go down quite a bit. No need to really rush this at this point because there's no spy attached to the unlocking here. Uh, the same wood bonus, food bonus that you have, the same cryo square bonus for reducing the time for uh, administrative um, efficiency for enacting royal decree, faster research basically, all sorts of bonus with upkeep in local areas. And this is a new building. This is a new building for us as Rhesus. And this is the banquet building. So for your units during a siege battle in this area, it's a defensive building, you'll get 10% extra armor piercing damage. And this bonus will go up all the way to 20%. And we'll also get extra morale for units under siege. We'll get one additional threshing guard as a garrison. And we will uh, reduce our own army's attrition due to various factors, including siege. So it's a very defensive building. I actually don't know if it's a good building or not. We're not here to make that statement right now, but just introducing a new building for uh, Rhesus's faction. And then the most important building is this new uh, unique building here, the Dolmen, uh, the Dolmen Shrine here in a Dolmen Complex. These will unlock different rituals for you. And this is going to be pretty key to build at least once, because if you don't have this once, you don't have access to all your rituals. And this is a pretty decent building by itself, plus 10%, you know, casualty replenishment. And then this will obviously go up, also giving you a bit of happiness on top of that. So I think this is quite a useful building to have uh, in your settlement, at least the first one. Um, and that's why we rushed the mud brick house. It was empty in the beginning. And the reason why we rushed it, because we want growth. Without growth, you can't upgrade these. You got to get your settlement up quickly. And finally, there is this great temple of Zabothura Dors. Uh, this is the one you can build in major settlements, in all major settlements, enables the oath uh, to this god. I'm not going to try to say his name twice. And you get additional bonus for all recruited units, melee defense, 10% to your warrior of Pangeon. This is a unique unit that is in our roster and then also reduces the upkeep of this unit for own armies in this province. So this is not stackable. This is not faction wide, uh, which is a bit of a shame because a lot of the special units or special buildings for the special units of different factions are faction wide boost. And this one's all when you're only in this province. Um, but if you have high influence, that's over 60%, you will be able to pick up 10 gold for this building. That is pretty nice, actually, to get some sort of gold income 
uh, from your special building that is tied to recruiting units. And then our military buildings are all similar but different. You know, they're the same buildings, except for this one. This one's a little bit unique to us. We are a tribal faction, Thresher and Tribes. So small tribal district, large tribal district. This re severely reduces the cost of wood construction in this region, this entire province. Um, so this is quite nice. Uh, I think this is a great building to just tack on. Unlocks the Worshipper of the Pan, which is this club unit that we'll look at a bit later. War Chanter is the spear unit that would reduce enemy uh, melee attack and melee defense. Uh, units will be the end, so let's not talk about them too much. The rest is the same. Obviously, you want to know which units are upgraded from which, um, but it makes you know pretty reasonable sense. You know, you have your basic slinger or javelin upgrading to a better javelin, your basic archer upgrading to a better archer, and the roster is mostly spear units and then a good dose of chariots. Uh, so that kind of wrap things up over here for unique buildings. Now to complement all that, there are also small changes to the Royal Decree for each faction. Um, and that's namely things like this, Chariot Resiliency, Chariot Might, because we're so focused on uh, Chariot units as a faction, they altered a bit of the Reform Tree here. It's not so noticeable for Rhesus, because he is still sort of within the Greek Trojan influence circle. But for Memnon, his Royal Decree tree will be quite different and focused on his unique faction mechanic that we will cover in a separate video today. Uh, that should be out as well. So if you're curious about that one, go check that one out as well. So that's all that makes our faction unique, to be honest. Uh, we're gonna hop over to a custom battle and take a look at uh, our units. There are 27 of them, so it will take a little bit of time. Uh, if you're curious about how to build uh, Rhesus, there will be a separate character guide, namely the skill tree guide, that will come out on a later date. Uh, so keep your eye out for that as well. And on to the custom battle. Alrighty, it's a bit messy. There's a lot of units, uh, but let's go over them one by one. So first up, we have our general. This is in historical mode, so he has bodyguard unit, and this is a chariot variant because our faction is very famous for our chariot. Uh, these are called uh, Mayor of Diomedes, not the same Greek Diomedes, but a separate one from the Thracian tribes, and they are excellent. So we have, as you can see, uh, they're called Mayors of Diomedes as the bodyguard unit. There's gonna be a separate unit called Mayors of Diomedes, so that's why they're just using the same unit for our bodyguards. High armor on these chariots, a uh, lot slower speed because of that at 64, High morale, 70, and we have decent amount of melee attack defense, but that's not what really chariots are about. We're about the charge bonus, which is 52, and we have, I would say, medium damage here at 102. Uh, there's quite a few abilities, including uh, Furious Charge, as we mentioned, where we can inflict the flanking penalties to enemy units, even when we charge in from the front. Uh, this is going to be nice, actually, as we mentioned. It's going to be a huge hit to enemy melee defense, and we can still flank from the back with our more mobile units. So either way, uh, this will be a great addition to our boost. Now the rest of the bonuses here are simply things we can pick up from our skill tree, so we're not going to talk too much about that. Uh, we are also siege attackers, since most generals in the game are siege attackers. Then moving on, we have a lot simpler units here. The Woodsmen. This is our Axe unit. There are going to be a lot of Axe unit in our party, as we mentioned before. They don't really use shields, they charge a lot. These are low armor, 15. Uh, decent morale though, 50. And we have decent amount of speed, 48 for these infantry because they're not cladded by heavy armor. Uh, their attack and defense stats are really bad for melee attack and melee defense. High damage though, and it's actually high armor piercing damage with these Axe. Uh, the ratio is good. And uh, decent amount of charge bonus included Furious Charge. So if anything, charging them in will reduce the enemy morale as well as their melee defense. So just for that, that is quite good. Moving on, we have the Mountaineers. These are not the upgraded version, they're just a different type of your infantry. Uh, they use the club. So as you can imagine, no more armor piercing damage. They will also not cause the Furious Charge, instead they have the Strider. Uh, basically, terrain does not bother them. There are no combat or speed penalties when they traverse all sorts of terrain, whether that's mud, forest, um, you know, you name it. 
it wouldn't bother them at all. Uh, not so high charge bonus and stats not good. You know, you can tell from this type of weapon, they're not really going to be your main damage dealers. Perhaps they can help you chase down a few of the enemy range. They'll be quite effective at that given their speed and also terrain neutrality here. Then moving on, we have the Plainsmen. Uh, now this is a sword and shield wielding unit, quite rare. Uh, they also have a range component. It's a small javelin that they can shoot out while on the move. Only one ammo though, so it's good for one charging shot. Uh, damage is on the low end. There's better javelin uh, on infantry than this, but uh, it's better than nothing. And obviously that javelin would be armor piercing. They're your more defensive option uh, with a slightly higher melee defense. Uh, still no armor, but at least we have a shield now that's good for 50% range block chance so they can help you tank a bit of arrow. Most units have pretty decent morale on the roster, which is nice because you'll be doing a lot of charging. You don't want to take too much damage initially and just route off the battlefield. That would defeat the purpose. And then we come to War Chanters, which we caught a glimpse of uh, during the building selections. And this unit has one special attribute called Titan uh, Smokes, which is this roar that they can do once per battle for 30 seconds around themselves that affects enemy units by dropping their melee attack and melee defense by 10% uh, within a 40 meter radius. This is obviously going to be stacked on any sort of flanking bonus you can create with Furious Charge, so that can be quite nice. Because they hold a spear, they have an anti-large bonus. I believe it's 10 extra damage against large, yes, uh, and they have pretty decent damage. They're more attack oriented compared to defense. Surprisingly high armor, perhaps just for the helmet, because the body, I guess they have a little breastplate over here. Uh, morale once again, quite high. Same speed as these guys who are not wearing much, so um, pretty good unit for a front charge that debuffs the enemy. Then, you know, playing dress up, we got a unit with now not only a 60% shield, 55 armor, once again, great morale, much slower now, much more focus on defense, hold the line type, uh, bonus is large because of the spear, and I think it's the same spear, so it's still the same 10 point damage. And pretty much a defense hold the line type of unit here, Thresh and Spearman. We have Worshipper of the Pan, which we saw in that tribal unique building that unlocks this unit. Uh, they hold a mace. And because of that, it's not going to be armor piercing. They will have Furious Charge plus Strider. So they will cover ground quickly and apply a debuff when they charge in. Decent charge, decent damage for infantry. Not as fast because they have a bit of armor. And the morale, once again, pretty high. Uh, average attack and defensive stats. Moving on to Threshing Guard. Uh, these are your elite uh, spear unit. They are once again focused on defense against large. Uh, good damage, really no charge because they're meant to stand still and defend with their high armor of 85 plus the 65% shield here. So this is your elite frontline option in your roster. And then we have the upgraded version of the uh, follower of Pan technically, uh, the Androphones. And these are, you know, once again another mace user. Uh, similar damage output, but much better armor, much better morale. I think the same speed actually. 30, oh, slightly slower, 42 versus 37. Uh, so the armor is weighing them down, but they do have Furious Charge here, uh, but no more Strider, because I guess the armor does weigh them down. They can't really traverse land as though it's nothing, uh, but you can see the theme is Furious Charge. Apply those debuffs, whether you're charging from the front or from the back. Then we have Dassel for Leaks. Uh, these are gonna be your actual flanking option. They don't have Furious Charge. You want to use them as a regular flanking unit because they have flank attack improved. They carry two Javelin of much better quality. Uh, they use a decent spear weapon with 15 against large because they're kind of holding it two-handed without a shield. Decent amount of armor. Pretty good speed at this armor, to be honest. Uh, 42 compared to this unit here, which is 37. Uh, there's a 10 armor difference, so it's not exactly comparable but overall not bad, good charge bonus as well. And on top of that, uh, they have a last stand and a last stand berserk. So how this work is once we drop below 50 health, we add a 20% melee defense to ourselves to make us harder to kill. But if we continue to bleed health and drop below 20%, we will become berserk. 
we will no longer be controllable and we will cause fear. So they perform better and better as they whittle down on the field. Um, it's not exactly what you want to see, but uh, it does make them useful. Uh, high morale makes them fight you know, closer to the bitter end, and they will last quite a while between the 50 and 20%, because with 20% boost, you're running at you know 65% plus whatever faction mechanics uh, bonus you can get on them from whether different divine wills bonus when you recruit them or other methods. Then moving on, Warrior of Pangeon. Uh, these are one of the elite units we can pick up from the ritual. So there's a limitation to those. Those three units, you can only recruit up to six. You can't go over that amount, unfortunately. And these units will have the Furious Charge. They will also have Cause Fear. And as with all units, if you can cause fear, you're also immune to fear. They're using an axe, uh, which gives them high armor piercing damage. They're the highest damaging units we've seen so far. Great melee attack and defense. Uh, just really a top of the line unit, which is why you can only grab these from that uh, ritual. I believe they're the major settlement unlock uh, with that great temple that you can build. Uh, high armor, high morale, good speed, just all around super solid unit. Then devoted to uh, Zao Moxies, this is another one of the great temple unit that you can recruit, also limited to 6. Uh, it's a heavy spear infantry, high armor, high morale, slow speed, but not too slow, it's decent. And uh, mostly focus on defense, good weapon, this is bonus against heroes and large actually. 5 points against heroes, which is actually quite interesting. I don't know why the weapon in particular would be great against heroes, but apparently it is. Uh, they also will carry a javelin, uh, good quality javelin, 36 damage, 2 ammo though, so it's a little bit limited, but it's better than nothing. Uh, they will also have uh, Titan Ismos, uh, which will debuff the enemy, only one use, so time it well. And the same last stand, so they will fight to the bitter end quite nicely. They're immune to all psycho uh, psychology, so any sort of fear or terror will not be applied to them. Then we have some light units, uh, they're ranged, that's why after all those, we are ended up back with uh, some cloth armor here. Uh, these are our beginner javelin units. Um, really don't need to look at their melee stats. They're obviously not great. The range is only 70 and the missile damage is not high either. Their only bonus is they're pretty good at running into positions with Shrider. Hopefully you can flank with them to apply some nice damage without shield because javelin still a decent amount of damage in terms of being armor piercing. Then we have our basic Archer, which are called Threshen Hunters, 150 range, not short, but not long either. Uh, Slingers would outrange these, and there's better Archer unit that would outrange these, but we take what we can. Um, 24 ammo, 20 damage, it's on the low end, and melee-wise, it's really not worth talking about. Then if we upgrade our Javelin unit, we have the Forest Ambushers. Uh, they have the same Strider, they're basically carrying a better Javelin at the end of the day with better uh, melee stats and armor. Still not a great unit. I feel like uh, for us, it's more about melee charging. The range options for Rhesus' faction doesn't really scream, uh, you know, in your face to say must recruit me or anything like that. Then Thresh and Bowman, uh, these are going to get 10 extra range, a bit better melee stats, a bit better damage. Actually, a lot better damage compared to the regular Huntsman Archer, uh, who I think only had 20 damage. I, I don't even know why they're worth recruiting. Uh, 42, much better here, a uh, slight upgrade. And then we have a even better upgrade to 47 damage, same range as them, being 160. Uh, the melee component damage becomes a lot better. These are now actually worthwhile melee unit with good armor, good damage, uh, decent enough defense, not really good melee attack, but with morale and armor at this point, with this high damage, they're not bad. So they're kind of your dual usage unit. Then we get to our main uh, course for the faction, which are chariot units. First, we have the light chariot. These are obviously known for their speed, um, not heavily armored, 80 speed here. Just charging in, you're not really gonna care about these stats, you're really just using your charge for damage. And moving across, they're spread quite wide. We have Threshen Chariot. This is the medium class, still 80 speed, uh, better armor, better morale. Uh, more charge, more damage. 
And then we have our elite version, which is called Mares of Diomedes, the same one that our general is using as his bodyguard. It's slower, a lot slower. It's a heavy chariot. Um, it's heavily armored, better charge, better damage, actually worth fighting in the thick of things because of the stats. Now, chariots, I still think, require a bit of microing after that post-launch nerf that hit them. Um, they're good, and as an added thing for the chariots of um, Reese's here, after you move on to the medium tier, there's this new ability called Barb Whips, where you sacrifice a little bit of your health to increase your speed for the next 20 seconds, so you can run out of situations or perhaps close gap on the charge, and they will have Furious Charge at this point as well. Um, only Strider on the light one. Same thing for the Mares of Diomedes. Um, pretty good choice uh, with applying the debuff, charging for whatever angle you want. Then we also have some range options. Uh, the basic Archer variant has really high speed, 95, so you can actually loop around people pretty easily here or chase down some easy targets. Harass with a 110 range, 50 damage, uh, you know, Archer. That's actually pretty good, um, but obviously the limitation would be you only have you know, so many carriages, so only so many arrows going to come from this unit. Good harass, regardless, and still can charge. Decent amount of uh, charge bonus. Then we have an upgraded variant called Thorns. They no longer use archers. They're now a javelin unit, as you can see. And that means the damage is going to be a lot higher. It's going to be armor piercing. They now learn how to use barbed whips. They no longer have the 95 speeds back to 80, but the armor is much better. Uh, basically a pretty solid medium chariot on top with some javelin options uh, as well. And then we have our Highland unit. These are our host um, armies, countless hosts. Um, it's not really worth looking at their stats and saying how bad they are because sure, they're terrible, but we already know once we get our forest counties up, the bonuses will kick in. You're getting 20% extra melee attack, 20% extra melee defense. These become 38, 36. You know, melee attack defense stats, not bad. There's 20% damage boost. There's going to be damage boost on not only the base damage, but also the armor piercing component. Uh, all sorts of boosts kicking in for these units. So they will become quite respectable despite the poor stats that you see here. And the reason why they have poor stats is because they're intended to get quite a bit of boost uh, from your ever increasing forest holdings. As you can see, the Raiders, you know, at this point, they'll be at 44, 52. Uh, it's really good. And Highland Warriors will be, you know, your sort of top end axe user. Um, they don't actually have any of your Furious Charge, which is interesting. Uh, what they do have is Vanguard Deployment. Um, they're meant as ambush raiding units, get behind your enemies, all sorts of sneaky usage. And finally, the best variant here, the Highland Tribesmen. They are probably the elite end of the unit you can have, only six of these. Um, you're looking at only 41, 56 stats, even with the boost. Um, these are not meant to be, you know, replacement of your elite army. They will just become suitable armies, especially after you get six stacks of them with 24s. You can reinforce with them, night battle with them, pick on the weak. And this is what the son of Strahman looks like. They're basically spear unit. They look very familiar to the spear variant we saw earlier, except for they don't have that much armor. Only 35. Um, their main thing is they act like a general, uh, they will have to encourage, and they're also unbreakable, which is nice, but as you might note, they have less units uh, than the standard 90, only a 60. Now, that is true for a lot of other variants of the, um, the Highland units, and some of the range units as well, and the more War Chanters, also a little bit less than 90. Uh, but that's going to do it. That's Reese's roster. Mainly focus on frontline charging melee units. Uh, lots of different chariot variants. A lot of the heavy ones are quite good uh, at dealing their damage and having high charge bonuses. And the playstyle is pretty straightforward. Get in enemy's face, apply debuffs, and kill them. So hope you guys enjoy this overview of Reese's faction for the upcoming DLC. And we'll be uh, having our Mimon uh, faction overview as well. So if you want to check that out, hop over to that video, which should also be live at the same time, and we'll see you guys there. Bye!